Hi everyone, here's the book chemist once again and today I'm reviewing The Phantom of the Opera by Gaston Leroux, a novel about a young woman who becomes the object of the attraction of two different men. One of them is an aggressive, self-centered, obsessive brute and the other one is The Phantom of the Opera. Phantom of the Opera is the most famous novel by Leroux, who is little read these days, but back in the day was quite the sensation and is still regarded as one of the early masters of detective fiction and had quite an exciting life for a writer. Phantom in particular has seeped into popular culture and his story, the story of the Phantom, is one I think most of us know uh, up to a certain level, mostly due to the 1925 movie adaptation starring Lon Chini, and even more thanks to the uh, the musical, the, the stage show, which I caught in London and found somewhat mediocre, definitely not nothing compared to the novel, I would say. And The Phantom, just like other fictional creations, has become such a staple of popular culture. The story of The Phantom of the Opera, of this strange creature who uh, lives and haunts the Opera Garnier Palace in Paris. It's become such a powerful story that it's become separated from its original source in the way all of these creations do. Uh, because they're so powerful, they take up a life on, of their own powered and fueled by the fans and admiring lovers of these stories that reinvent them and adapt them to their own times and their own conditions. Uh, but I will still argue that other fictional creations such as Dracula, such as Sherlock Holmes, other very successful fictional characters are still tied to their original source in a way that's not necessarily the case for the Phantom. All I'm trying to say is that I'm ready to wager that many more people these days read Dracula or the Sherlock Holmes stories or Frankenstein uh, or uh, Jekyll and Hyde. Many more people read these novels than they read Phantom of the Opera. So how does the novel stand up? Should it be more widely read? Should it be reconsidered and appreciated as a great work of horror or fantasy or imaginative fiction? The first striking thing about Phantom of the Opera is how talented Leroux is at setting up his mysteries, the many secret and machinations that make the novel so exciting and enticing. He is really great at setting them all up to cause the greatest thrills in the reader. Very early into the narrative we become acquainted with all of these rumors surrounding this opera ghost that lives in the uh, Paris Opera Palace. He is supposed to have a death's, a, a skull, a death's head for a head, but sometimes he appears as a floating red head in the cellars underneath the palace. He has an entire box to himself, supposedly he receives a stipend, a salary from the opera managers and all of these mysteries look bizarre and really insoluble except that once you finally manage to crack them once the narrator and, and the characters figure them out and you're presented with the solution they actually appear quite clear and even even easy it's Leroux's masterful presentation that made them look so so wonderfully complex and enigmatic. It's this kind of trick, this kind of narrative will sound very familiar to fans of Sherlock Holmes. It's that same type of presentation that makes the deduction work of the detective look all the more astonishing. So Phantom is worth a read if you're into those types of mysteries, even just to enjoy the many games that the novel presents. My favorite was this idea that when the Persian and the Vicomte de Chigny are hunting for, our, uh, are hunting for the, the Phantom in the cellars, they're supposed to keep their arms straight in front of them, as if they're all holding a pistol, even if they're not holding a pistol in their hand, just this gesture is what was going to save their lives. And I couldn't for the life of me figure out why and when the the secret the mystery is finally revealed it's quite a shocking but also quite an easy explanation and there are so many of these nice little games that make the novel such a pleasure to read and its setting is also a triumph most of the novel is set again in the opera garnier except for a chapter uh, set on the on the breton coast which is 
unnecessary, but also uh, it's, it's not really a harmful little chapter. And there's a few scenes that are set uh, around Paris. Otherwise, the entire story takes place in the palace, which becomes almost a city within a city and is explored in all its uh, alcoves and its snooks and its secret passages and creates a, tr a, a place of great magic and, and great mystery, really the perfect setting for a novel of intrigue and, and, and sinister machinations such as this. You get to experience some of the machines that allow these huge expensive productions to be put out every night for the enjoyment of the creme de la creme of Parisian society. You get to experience the various castes who leave behind the scene the dancers and the singers, the stars, some stars who are rising and some, some who are fading. You get to meet the stablemen and the firefighters and all the various workers who collaborate on this imaginative fictional worlds that are created on the stage every night. It's a really fascinating description and setting and, at least based on an afterword that was included in my edition, is quite true to life. Leroux didn't have to exaggerate much in his description of the Opera Palace to create this magical, unique setting, which makes the novel all the more intriguing. Beyond the setting, the main heart of the action, as I mentioned, concerns Christine, a talented young singer who has, uh, becomes entangled in this love triangle with the Phantom of the Opera himself, this mysterious borderline supernatural figure, and the Vicomte de Chigny, uh, a young admirer of hers. The novel that Phantom of the Opera reminded me of most closely is probably Jane Eyre, which is another narrative where you have a heroine that's torn between two different men, both of whom are really awful and act terribly toward her. Just as I don't really think Mr. Rochester deserves Jane, I really don't think the Vicomte de Chigny deserves Christine in, in this novel. He is exceedingly jealous, he doesn't really trust her, all in all he just behaves horribly toward her, and yet the narrative le leads us to believe that she is into him and will have to uh, take it at face value. I'm guessing he is extremely hot, unless it's that nobiliary particle, it's the Chigny, it's the nobiliary title that she's after, which would make her a much more understandable character. I would understand that motive, although I don't think, based on her description, that that's Christine's intention, really. As with Jane Eyre, of course, there is much to be appreciated in this story and in this novel, even if you don't really understand, or at least you don't really endorse, the types of emotions that are expressed between the characters that people this story. In fact, you can really read Phantom as almost a manual, a handbook, on teenage obsessiveness and possession and jealousy, coming both, by the way, from the Phantom, all of these ugly feelings from the Phantom and from the Vicomte de Chigny in different ways and different degrees. As you've probably guessed by this description, the book is steeped in the most sordid, most hazy and heated type of romanticism. Of course, what ties Christine and this monstrous figure of the Phantom together is their shared love for music and their passion for singing and for music in general, which transcends the uh, monster's ugliness and creates this connection between them. And overall, at the end of the, the day, no spoilers, but it is love that triumphs and that saves uh, the characters and, and leads the story to a, a possible resolution. Because the Phantom, of course, is a very interesting and very curious monster. By the way, he is referred to as a monster throughout the book, it's not my judgement, and though he is, by all means, a monstrous person. He, uh, what makes him so monstrous is that, as is repeated a few times throughout the book, he regards himself as standing outside the domain of humanity. He regards himself as beyond the pale of humanity, and so he believes that the laws of morality, of the law, and of justice that uh, control human interactions do not really apply to him. But at the same time, the reason why he sees himself as outside this domain, he's, it's because he's been seen and regarded as inhuman all his life, starting with his own parents. And eventually, it is kindness and it is, again, love 
that redeems him. And all that he is really after is this very simple act of acceptance, this very simple act of being seen and being loved for his own self as a person, as any other person is accepted, uh, esteemed and loved for their own self. This solution, of course, is obviously part of the novel's romantic outlook on, on life, of that hazy romanticism I was talking about. It is a somewhat straightforward, somewhat simplistic, naive view on human relationships. It's far from unproblematic. Uh, among other things, I find it a pretty bourgeois view on life, this idea that a little bit of kindness solves everybody's problems. But it is, it makes for a rather pretty narrative, and it is why Phantom and other deeply romantic narratives such as this are so enduring and, and so popular, really. And hey, I'm not at all saying there's no value in that. Kindness is a really powerful tool. Another reading that interests me a lot, though, is this idea that the Phantom learned his craft, learned all his uh, debauched killing arts and his trap making and his torturing and his uh, stabbing from established power. He learned his craft as a phantom and a monster at the court of eastern kings, eastern sultans and, and rulers. And in a way it's these rulers, these, these forms of organized power, that turned him into a killing machine and later let him lose upon society. It's, uh, it's made explicit by the Persian in the book that the Phantom himself doesn't really understand that what he's doing, that these killing acts that he, commitment, he committed are wrong. He just doesn't understand it, especially because he was acting to, to chase the favor of the, of the Sultan, of a, of a young woman ruler in these Eastern kingdoms. I find this a very interesting concept because it turns the Phantom from almost a glitch within society, a monstrous accident that happened within it, within, within it to almost a byproduct of power, of power that tries to turn people into its tools, into, into its killing machines, and in so doing unleashes these great horrors on society. This situation, the corrupting uh, influence of power, is moved in the novel to the east. Again, it's in Turkey and in Persia that the Phantom learns his craft. And that's part of the novel's, again, not unproblematic orientalist view. All of these horrible things don't happen in France. They happen in the far, uh, well, the Near East, in these far locations. But I find it a very interesting reading because only four years after the novel's publication, the novel was published in 1910, the powers of Europe, in the heart of Europe itself, would unleash monstrous powers onto entire generations of young people and turn them into monstrous killing machines. Overall, Phantom of the Opera is a really stimulating and thought-provoking novel. It's really fast, it's really quite surprising in its twists, and it's written in a style that's often surprisingly lyrical. At one point, a parched man, a man that's dying of thirst, describes the word ripple as a word that you hear with your tongue. Isn't that beautiful? It's a must read for anyone with a passion for eddy, sordid romanticism, and for anybody who's interested in the history and the evolution of horror fiction, of monster tropes within our literature, and on Gothic fiction, interested in Gothic fiction, there's obviously a very interesting Freudian reading of the novel that deserves to be uh, commented and, and, and explored. Uh, there's that section where Christine and the Vicomte de Chigny are playing at being engaged, and there's that whole idea that she is happy to play around the upper uh, levels and the upper floors of the opera with him, but he's obsessed with the underground and what lies underneath, and he just wants to go there. Uh, but I won't comment on it because that's not my department. I really was surprised by how much I enjoyed Phantom of the Opera and how well, almost well, more than a hundred years after it was published, it still reads as a fresh, exciting, uh, engaging story. 
I'm really curious to hear what you thought of the novel, especially if you read it in the original French. I'm curious to hear if you had that sense that it was quite quite lyrical um, and quite well written. It wasn't just a fast read, but it had something going on for itself, even on the level of style. I'm very curious about it. And more broadly speaking, I'm very curious to hear what you thought uh, in the comment section below. Uh, thank you, as always, for watching the video. Thank you for my, for, uh, to my patrons for supporting the YouTube channel. And I will see you in the next review. See you. Bye, everyone.